Here it is then, my finished race car for this season and it's going to Silverstone for my first car race and its first race under my management tomorrow. As you can see, this is it finished. I've got the decals on. So how did it get to this point? Cue montage to this journey. <laughs> Well, there we have it. It's had its first wash under my management and it actually looks in pretty bloody good nick. I mean, look at the hydrophobia already, which is always a good measure of how well looked after the paint is. I put some Meguiar's ceramic wax on it and it's bonded really well, which means there aren't too many surface contaminants. The outside's all clean. We'll dive into the inside tomorrow, try and up that tick over rev so it ticks over a bit more comfortably, which we can do with a throttle screw at the back. And that is a perfect example of how simple and beautifully easy classic cars are to work on. Can't wait to get Hoover into those dirty bits. Oh. <laughs> hydraulic handbrake. I'm told that's really useful on the race starts for holding it on a hill because it's just a bit of a sharper connection when you release it when the lights go out. Now my weapons of choice for this cleaning mission are this, a detailing brush to really get into all the nooks and crannies, and this, household elbow grease. After cleaning the whole interior, there were a few bits of flaky paint and actually we thought they were rust initially and there are a few spots of rust as you can see there and there. I'll talk about why they're going blue in a second, but actually the car seems to have come out of the factory in a sort of ready brown colour. So when this white paint has chipped off, it's just revealing the old brown colour, but there are still a few spots of rust, but not that many at all. So what I've done is on the patches of rust, I've chipped off any loose paint all around the car and then if it's revealed something with any oxidization at all I've painted hammerite cure rust on it and that's gonna sort of break down the rust and provide a barrier a layer on top and then I can paint over it with some rust proof hardcore hammerite paint again well this has escalated as it always does doesn't it so yeah we decided that spraying was the best option as brushing did leave some brush stroke marks as you can see hopefully you can see there and it wasn't the sort of hard enamel finish that i was going for so i've painted the areas that are either hard to reach or needed a thicker coat with a brush paint and brush now i'm using this hammerite spray paint which is leaving a smooth top coat smooth and for those of you wondering about the door cards this car came with red faux leather, basically wood covered door cards that are incredibly heavy. So I've actually bought a fiberglass sheet and I'm gonna cut it and shape it to this size to fit the door cards in. Cut out the window slot for the rolly uppy bit and then door handle as well. And then this is gonna be a lightweight all white door, which I think will look and perform really nicely. This is the last of the paint done. It looks a lot better than I thought it ever would. It looks really white clean. Now I have to rip off all of this masking tape, ideally before everything gets too dry. <laughs> I bought a large white sheet of fiberglass, cut out the holes, then used a spray adhesive to stick the red vinyl covering to the top. I had to of course buy lots of bits and bobs for the build and here is some of the biggest parts. I 
have the Cobra seat, and then of course mounting hardware, side mounts, I've got my foot plate, my heel rest, my quick release mount, and this is all fitted to the car later in the video. To get rid of that chunky boss adapter, I've now got this weld-on quick release. It gives me maximum access when I'm getting into the car, and as it's welded, it becomes one with the column, and there's absolutely no movement. It's the most solid form of attachment. It gives a positive click when it's snapped on and off, so you know it's not going anywhere. The next job is fitting my race navigator system, which is all of my telemetry and my screen. So I'm gonna fit the unit so that the screen is here and the unit sort of goes on top and it drops down in that nice L shape. In order to do that, I need to move the isolator, the oil pressure light, and all four of these lights. And this little switch down here. Instead of having this bigger, bulkier oil pressure light, I've got another one of these in orange. So I'm gonna move these lights and the new updated oil pressure light down to this area here on a mounting plate. The important thing to do during this job is make sure that I do not get any wires mixed up. Let's get started. And I'm currently lying down with my knees over the roll bar, lying down over here, around the fire extinguisher, and yeah, my chiropractor keeps asking, what do you do to put your back out? This, this is what I do. now time to fit the race nav, a big reason why a lot of things move. So I've got places rigged up all around the car for the cameras and for the unit. As you can see, there's now a clear space in the middle of the car for my race navigator. And I have one camera point here that's going to look at me as I drive and one camera point up here looking forward. I'm also gonna have a GoPro next to it and also a GoPro at the back probably. So I can produce some really great content for you when I'm racing. Changing the seat is when the car truly felt like it became mine. I removed the old OMP seat and then fitted my very snug Cobra seat, which I would recommend to anyone who's very slim. I used a cardboard template to mark out the drill pattern and then drilled to a standard M8 fitting, which is the standard for all race seats. All four of my holes are drilled, so now in these two conveniently placed areas, I'm probably gonna drill my six point harness. So what I need to do is just offer up the seat, check the angle, because what you want is the crotch strap should be either 20 degrees behind or forward from vertical as specified in MSA regulations. Personally, I believe 20 degrees backwards is slightly more optimal, so I'll see how it fits into this range. The seat is actually an incredibly high load bearing component, especially at the front end, because when you lean back into the seat, it obviously tips it up. And we've got lots of washers to make sure we're distributing that load as much as we can. The floor beneath is completely flat other than these little ridges. So I'm making sure that I spread the weight evenly among a ridge and I'm not at any pinch points. As for the six points, you use large backing plates like this in order to spread the load. I really like this Cobra seat and especially the breathable fabric I think I'm gonna love when it's getting hot and sweaty mid-race. So now it's time to check, have I drilled all the holes in the right places? Yeah, it's all fitted. The reds match quite nicely. I'm pleased we put the quick release in because this chair has higher side bolster cushions so it's much harder to get in and out. So the quick release is gonna help hugely with that. I'm actually just gonna swap out this cushion at the front because I got a higher one. And the reason why a high cushion at the front is important, especially in this seating position, you're sitting higher up and the pedals swing downwards in that sort of motion. You tend to sit with a more bent knee and you need support under your knee to make sure that you don't get ache. And with the last seat, I was definitely getting leg ache. So this one is the medium cushion from Cobra. 
which just tears out and then I'll put the high cushion in. I now have good support under my knees. Whilst we're talking about driving position, I also have a heel plate to go under my feet to raise my feet up slightly because at the moment with the travel of the brake, which is of course the most power requiring and important pedal, I find that as I push further down it comes a bit too high onto my toes so I'm not getting the full feel and power that I could be getting from myself. I'm not in an optimum position for my body. I also have a footrest for my clutch. This one is well out of reach and I can't use it to hold myself in. So I'm gonna put another plate just there so I can really keep myself steady. Here I've got a lithium battery, which means it can go flat and it doesn't damage it. It's much lighter, it's a fifth of the weight of this one and it's got the same cranking power and a very similar capacity. So this is a much, much better option, lithium. Bit more expensive, but long term, probably worth it. Removing the old battery revealed a foam sheet on the floor to stop vibrations. And of course, with the new battery being a different size and a new location, I had to rip off this foam and respray the area like I did the rest of the interior. This was one of my favourite things to do, the new roll cage foam, because it's such a cheap and simple thing, yet it makes such a difference to the interior. And now we have the final touches, that electrical tape to stop the headlights shattering. And you can see the difference between the polished and unpolished side of the bonnet there, I'm very pleased with that, whipping out the auto glim. And then I've got new bonnet catches and leather straps. So a few of the extra bits that I've done, the little touches that really make a big difference. For example, we've got renewed decals, Fraser rim. I've got my 34 on here, and I'm running a sort of period livery to match the Fraser, so no backing plates, just numbers straight on the car. Got my name, so this is Hamish is his name, so now he knows who he belongs to, he's branded. I've also made a few changes under the bonnet. All I've done really is disassemble everything, give it a good clean to check things are in working order, painted the rails for the fuel tank, just trying to clean everything up. New fuel pump because I think we had some issues testing when we were doing that, so everything should be tickety-boo. In the car, of course, we now have my little race nav cameras looking at me and looking forward. We're rigged up for GoPros, we're rigged up for audio, so I make lots of great content for you. My screen is there so I can monitor my laps, how I'm getting on. Is that corner better than I did last lap with a live updating delta, which is so invaluable. And as you saw in the video, I've got all the little touches I added with the fresh battery, the wheel that keeps falling off, very dangerous that. And another thing which James Ibbotson helped me do, big thanks to him, is this bent gear lever. I found that when I was strapped in, I actually had to sort of wiggle my shoulder down to reach the gear stick as I seem to have quite short arms. So this is a great little extension, it means I'm in a comfortable, strong position, I'm strapped in tight, and I don't have to wiggle around to reach the gear stick. And in another video, you will see how I made this beautiful button box, because this was a lot of work, but I'm really glad I did it. I've got my isolator, ignition, main beam, a lot of the switches that were where the race navigator is now in this nice, tidy unit, all made out of carbon fibre, rather posh. And of course, in situ, you can now see these fresh door cards that really tie in that red colour palette for the inside of the car if we want to be all designery. But yeah, this is how Fraser raced them with the red door cards, so we're trying to keep it as period as possible. After being told by Bevan, another competitor of Fraser Imps, that the wheels should be as wide as possible all around the car, I've added some extended wheel nuts at the rear for now, and then I've got some different offset wheels coming to make sure that I can get everything as far out as possible to maximise the performance. There's a few other little bits coming to really extract maximum performance out of this car, but you'll see them in future videos. So, I'm going to go get this loaded onto the trailer for Silverstone. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.